Okay. Welcome, one and all. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, pleasure to have you all with us. Uh, happy Sunday to you all. Uh, we are joined today uh, not only uh, by the one, uh, the only uh, Sarah Thompson, uh, of course, uh, but also uh, by some guests from uh, yes. La Montagna, uh, Mount Etna, uh, Mongimelo. Um, well, we have uh, Antonio uh, Benanti uh, and uh, Alice Bonacos uh, joining us from Sicily. Uh, uh, and, and so it's a really very special, very special lesson. Um, and uh, we uh, are really excited to share these wines with you. Um, and I'm excited to, um, you know, kind of give up the microphone and give them a chance to um, talk uh, about uh, this amazing landscape and um, these, you know, soulful wines that are really steeped in, you know, thousands of years worth of uh, history. Um, at any rate, um, just to give you all a sense of uh, what we're drinking, um, how to provision, uh, we have a, a, a rainbow of wines with us uh, today. Um, Etna has many gifts, um, uh, white and red, uh, for the sake of fine wine to offer. Um, we were selling four uh, through the restaurant, particularly for this lesson, although um, at any given time, uh, we have all sorts of wines uh, in the mix um, at both Tail of Goat and, uh, you know, uh, we're going to at Reveler's Hour uh, because these are wines that we love and they are wines that deserve um, a, a much bigger audience. Um, and they, you know, are truly on par with any of, um, you know, the great growing regions in the world. You know, people talk about, you know, Barolo and Brunello um, in the context of, you know, the great Italian wine making regions. But, you know, Mount Etna um, mm. certainly um, belongs in that in that conversation. Um, so I have a white and a uh, Etna Rosado, which is a fascinating uh, wine, a bit of a peasant's wine, one of my favorite wines in the world. Um, here, um, uh, the white is from uh, Alice's Vineyard. Um, the Rosado is from Massimiliano Calabretta. Uh, we have Antonio uh, Benanti's Etna, uh, Etna Rosso behind it. Um, and then um, Mario uh, Paluzzi, um, his uh, Etnias. Hopefully he's able to, uh, to join us uh, as well. Um, Thompson, if you see him in the mix, uh, uh, notify me. Uh, um, Mario is the only one that is operating on uh, Sicilian time, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, at any rate, uh, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, we're going to get to um, the matter uh, at hand. So um, today we're celebrating uh, the power of wine to transport. Uh, not only through the glass, but, um, you know, through the added element of, of travel and learning. So uh, we are joined from our studio in Adams Morgan, uh, 1775 Columbia uh, Road, Northwest Washington, D.C., um, by uh, Alice Bonacorsi uh, in Mount Etna. Alice, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi. Hi. Yeah, and uh, Antonio, Bonanti, <laughs> Antonio Bonanti with a map of Mount Etna behind him. Hello. Brilliant. And as always, uh, from less further afield, Sarah Thompson. Uh, brilliant. And, and we might have another guest uh, in the mix as well. Um, should be very exciting. Um, so we always start off with uh, a bit of uh, verse. Um, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't do a bit of shameless uh, self-promotion, as always. Uh, just a, a teaser next week if you're buying food from us at either restaurant. Um, lamb ribs. That's all I'm going to say. Lamb ribs, exclamation point. They're making a comeback. Um, we do have uh, additional uh, merchandise to show off. Uh, that is additional wine school merchandise. Um, uh, this is a, a t-shirt. Oh, no. Um, this is not the screen that I was hoping that you would all see. There we go. It is the, that is an excellent question t-shirt. Uh, Tail of Goat Wine School. Those are live uh, through our website uh, for you all to purchase for you. Uh, so desire. So uh, stock up uh, while you can. Uh, for the sake of verse, um, we're going to kick it uh, old school. Um, and uh, this is uh, Virgil, uh, the famous Roman poet. Um, and this is from the Aeneid, uh, book three. Uh, I am not going to uh, share a screen on the text itself. I'm going to share a screen on um, a, a glimpse of uh, the mountain itself, because uh, Mount Etna is an extremely beautiful place. Um, and uh, you kind of have to see it to fully, um, you know, appreciate its glory. So uh, again, this is, uh, this is Virgil. Um, the port is large and sheltered from the winds, but at 
Etna near, with frightful dissolution roars at times, sending up bursts of black clouds in the air, with rolling smoke of pitch and flashing spark, and globes of flame that lick the very stars. Then from the bow of the mountain torn, huge stones are hurled and melted rocks heap up a roaring flood of fire. Tis said that here, Enceladus, half blasted by the bolts of heaven, was thrust beneath the mountainous mass, and mighty Etna piled above sends forth his fiery breathing from the broken flues. And every time he turns his weary sides, all Sicily groans and trembles, and the sky is wreathed in smoke. That is Mount Etna, and you know, in as much as um, you know, is a beautiful place that makes beautiful wines. It has this kind of um, you know psychological hold over the landscape, over the Southern Mediterranean, over um, you know anywhere you know, kind of um, you know, in its shadow. Um, and uh, it is you know steeped in uh, poetry, you know. Uh, poets have been celebrating Etna since antiquity through uh, the modern era. Uh, the name of the mountain itself comes from the Greek, I burn. Um, in the uh, Sicilian dialect, they say Munji Bedu. Um, in Arabic, they say Jabal al Nar, which is the mountain of fire. Um, and uh, it is formed uh, as part of a uh, subjection zone. So um, you basically have a collision of worlds, which feels fitting. So you have the uh, African tectonic plate. Um, sliding north and east into the Eurasian plate. And Etna um, sits at the um, kind of intersection of those continental plates. And uh, it's kind of funny, you know, I, I feel like every time the subject of making wine on Etna, you know, comes up, people ask, you know, how, how could you live there? You know, how could you make wine there? And, um, you know, having been there, I, I think, you know, and I'll let uh, Alice and Antonio speak to this themselves, but um, people see the blessings of living there. You know, uh, the mountain gives as much um, as it threatens. And then on top of that, in as much as there are regular eruptions and, you know, regular earthquakes as well, it's like riding the subway. You get used to it, you know? And, and I think, you know, even with the little tremors, it's something that becomes a part of your life. And, you know, unless it's, you know, out of scale, unless it's a once a century eruption or earthquake, you know, it becomes a part of your life and, and people learn to um, adapt, which, you know, is worth celebrating in and of its own. Um, Mount Etna climbs well over 10,000 feet um, through the 19th century. Actually, one of the biggest exports from Etna was ice. Uh, that sounds really weird to say, um, you know, to get ice from a volcano, but it is that tall. Um, and, you know, uh, in mm. winter, you know, it, you know, will snow. There are ski resorts on the top of the mountain, um, you know, so, uh, it is, as you go up, a, a very cool place and, you know, above about 1,500 feet, um, too cold to reliably ripen grapes. Um, they have been making wine on Mount Etna, um, you know, since before recorded um, history, um, at the very least. Um, traditionally, um, they would do so in a, a site called a, a pista. So pista would just be a, um, essentially a, a massive stone. Um, and they would uh, dig that out and then give space um, for, after you stomped the fruit, um, the juice to run off uh, into another vessel. And you can see an outdoor, um, this is an outdoor, what we call palmento or pista, on the mountainside. And um, the mountainside of Etna is, is littered with hundreds uh, of these. So the notion of making wine on Etna is not novel um, or new uh, in the least. It is palmento. at least 6,000 years old, um, the oldest evidence. Um, Sicily, uh, throughout its history, has been traded between, um, you know, empires and civilizations. It has passed from um, the Greeks to the Romans to the Franks to the Vandals to the Byzantines to the Arabs um, to, uh, you know, the Normans. It's been fought over by various uh, Spanish and French empires, all the while it has made wine. Um, in terms of a modern wine infrastructure, um, as a exportable product. The Romans began that, um, but uh, it really um, started in Etna for the sake of uh, hardier red wine um, in uh, the 19th century, um, 18th and 19th century, after phylloxera hit the vineyards of Europe, um, Sicily became an alternative uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, sturdy red wine. And uh, red wine in Sicily um, became a very popular import throughout Europe. Um, and it was used to add bulk, um, to add 
um, ballast to add body and weight to wines elsewhere in Europe. And, um, you know, there's still a lot of um, unscrupulous producers in northern Italy um, who say they're making northern Italian wine, but are actually making Sicilian wine. Um, you know, that still happens to this day. Um, Marsala, um, you know, throughout um, that time was the most, um, you know, kind of widely known um, uh, Sicilian wine. But I think, you know, locally, the wines of Etna have really held sway over the local imagination and, and been, you know, um, you know, kind of the noble wines uh, of the island. And uh, Etna in the modern era was the first um, DOC. It was the, uh, on uh, the island of Sicily. Um, it was the first protected uh, designation of origin established uh, in uh, the 60s. Um, one of my favorite quotes uh, before I, I pass it off and, and we actually taste the wines here about Sicily uh, comes from Marco uh, De Bartoli. Marco De Bartoli um, is this uh, pioneering producer of Marsala in the modern era. Uh, he's, you know, highly opinionated, um, very Sicilian, uh, but he said that Sicily didn't change from the Arab invasion in the ninth century until after World War II. Um, he doesn't mean that literally, um, but what he means is that, you know, Sicily, you know, is a culture that was very um, agrarian and locally rooted. Um, and uh, I think, you know, in terms of the products that were, they were making, people weren't, um, you know, concerned as much with, um, you know, innovating. Um, uh, but that changed uh, after World War II. Um, and, uh, and that changed on Etna um, beginning in the 80s uh, and 90s for the sake of their wines as a younger generation, um, as embodied by Alice um, and Antonio um, and Antonio's father, um, you know, really started uh, to want to make wines that, you know, could um, be sold on the international market. And that didn't correspond to um, the traditional uh, image of wine on Etna, which tended to be, you know, more kind of oxidized wines uh, for local uh, consumption. So um, without further ado. And um, Mario we'll is on the call now. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, welcome, ciao Mario. Um, uh, I'll have to bring him into the mix. Um, wonderful. Uh, so uh, we have uh, three of the um, best known um, and uh, finest winemakers um, uh, on uh, Etna today. Um, ciao Mario. Is ciao, ecco mi qua, ciao. Oh, Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. You joining? Oh, oh uh, my pleasure. Well, no, excellent. Thank and, you very much. and Mario, so you're, are you in your palmento? Yes, I mean, ah. uh, yeah, I'm uh, in the in my palmento, yeah. Okay, so great. So um, now the palmentos is palmentos, the word for the traditional uh, wine making facility throughout Sicily. Um, and you can see, I had a picture of one lined up, but I don't need to use that picture anymore because um, uh, Mario got the memo and is showing it off uh, in real time. Thank you so much. So, uh, Mario, yeah, this is this is not the working palmento, but oh, okay. we will do one in the next uh, couple of years. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um, so, uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, our guests and you, we're going to taste through the wines. We have uh, four wines here, including um, your old vine, and uh, we're just going to let you all speak to these. Uh, uh, we don't have Massimiliano in the mix, um, so I'll talk about his Etna Rosato having visited, but um, I've, I've talked enough here, um, and I want to give it over to uh, Alice Bonacorsi. She's going to talk about her Etna Bianco, which is based on the great Caracante. So, uh, Alice, for, for everyone's sake, um, how did your family get involved with winemaking on Mount Etna? Oh, sorry, but I, I had a cotton pasticcio. Oh, no worries. That's okay. So I'll... No, no, I'll... I, I, I... What are you, Alicia? Yes, we have, but, technical, we have some technical to... difficulties. It's okay. Um, Alicia, One moment. No, no worries. You, you work that out. I'll tell, I'll tell the folks about, um, you know, uh, Etna White Wines. So Etna White Wines come from a bunch of native grapes, but the most important two are Caracante and Caterato. So Caracante um, is a, a native grape that comes from- One moment. Oh, no worries. Uh, one moment, because I, I, I don't see any, nothing. Um, Alicia, you still? I used to generate the scolegarti, I recall it. <laughs> I, I try again, try again. Uh, very exciting, that is, uh, that is none, the other than Robert Kennedy, uh, the importer of these wines in the mix uh, on his fabulous uh, green headset um, that's going to be trending uh, on the uh, Wine School Instagram very shortly, Robert, nicely done. So um, uh, while Alicia works out of technical difficulties, uh, Caracante, the grape name comes from uh, the Italian word carica, which means load, because it's a grape that can be very overproductive. 
Um, so if you work with it in the valley, it's a grape that, you know, can make a lot of wine, which is a good thing, you know, if you want to make wine at scale. But for the sake of making, you know, fine wine, typically is a bad thing. Um, Caracante is a grape that has very high acid. Um, and, you know, for me, oh, there we have you back, uh, Alicia. Okay. Ah, perfect, perfect. Um, so I was, I was I am here, about... yeah. I'm here. Okay. Excellent. How about... About my wine. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I was I was talking about Caracante. Um, yes, did, yes, sir. I uh, I don't I don't see, but uh, I understand. What you were able to hear. Excellent. Um, I uh, want to say something um, about Mount Etna uh, because, as as you said, uh, Mount Etna is the highest uh, um, active volcano in Europe. But for us, um, it's not just this, because for us uh, is. Uh, Etna is uh, like uh, a good, a very good mother, uh, because uh, um, with the um, with the, the fog <coughs> and ash that you show uh, before, um, for us is a, a very in, important fertilization of the soil. So um, is uh, is not only um, a place for us Etna, but is uh, an amazing place that give us a lot. Of a um, very important, um, um, very important thing of, to to make a very good wine. Uh, about uh, um, Etna Bianco, um, the uh, since um, to, twenty years ago, Etna was uh, well known for the red wine, uh, but um, white grapes. Um, were just used to improve the um, the red wine, the red, the red wine, yes, and uh, um, all, only uh, from twenty years. And one of the one of the first uh, was the um, Pietra Marina, the the Bianco of uh, the friend uh, Antonio, um, was one of the first Etna Bianco. Uh, because uh, um, um, Etna, in Etna, we produce, um, the people produce uh, um, in uh, the past only uh, red grape and the white was planted only in the place where the, um, the red uh, doesn't ripe very well. Um, um, Alicia, so I'm going to show a map of Mount Etna. Will you give people a sense of where this vineyard site is and where your winery is? Uh, yes, you you show the map. Yep, here we go. Okay, my my winery is uh, is in because uh, is about this Passo Picciaro. Oh yeah, um, so Passo Picciaro is is, is uh, right um, just north of Castiglione di Sicilia. Uh, uh, Sicilia. And then where is the vineyard for this particular Caracante? The, um, the, the, where, where is the, the, the vineyard of Caracante? Yeah, yeah, for this wine, the Valceresa. Valceraza, Valceraza makes from, from a vineyard of 100% of Caracante. Uh -huh. And uh, the grape, um, we um, make the harvest at the, at the end of October, so when the grape is very, very ripe. And uh, we decided that the, the moment uh, of the harvest, uh, when uh, um, the, the seed inside the grape are uh, sweet, are uh, like um, um, almond. When you taste the seed and the seed is uh, um, like a roasted almond, the, the time is, uh, is ready, the grape is ready. So uh, always the, um, the harvest is uh, at hand of uh, at hand of October. Uh, sometimes um, after the the red uh, grape, and um, um, at, as we produce this wine uh, with a um, particular way because uh, we crush the grape, we put the grape in the press and uh, um, the, the grapes stay uh, in tanks at the 20 degrees, so it's very low temperature. Um, then after the fermentation, we left the, the wine for two years surly, and uh, we make batonnage every 15 days, and uh, then every month, and for two years the wine stays surly. 
and um, for uh, the vintage 2015 um, to 16 is the vintage uh, we have uh, this, uh, this evening um, we it was a very uh, interesting vintage uh, because it's um, is um, good uh, good rain enough rain and uh, good temperature during the summer so the um, the, the grape is uh, very um, is ripe is very good ripe and uh, um, we um, our um, uh, philosophy is uh, to uh, to put in the bottle the the vintage uh, not the best vintage but the vintage has we found because uh, um, uh, we our philosophy is to produce good one good grape good grape and then in the in the winery we follow the grape so we produce a different wine have here uh, because we want to um, to produce the uh, wine that uh, um, that uh, uh, show the the vintage has uh, the vintage was um, not uh, we don't um, had any um, chemical product because uh, uh, we have a, a very small uh, winery and uh, we um, are used to uh, produce um, in natural way uh, so we have um, um, in the vineyard we don't use any pesticide we have a um, certified um, certification of ICA and uh, uh, in the winery uh, we don't use any chemical product but uh, we um, we follow the grape and uh, we use uh, uh, we use only physical we don't use chemical but we we have to use physical so we use a uh, temperature and uh, oxygen in the vinification oh, uh, so well right. so uh Alicia, what do you look for when you're tasting this wine what do you you know, like about, you know, this particular expression of Terraconte? When, when? What, when? What do you, what do you, uh, what do you like about this uh, particular expression of? Okay, I can't. Um, I, when I taste the, 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 this vintage, yeah, I understand that the um, Caricante is a very, um, interesting grape because they have a very high acidity uh, when uh, um, the the first time that my consultant come in uh, in the winery um, about around uh, 15 years ago uh, she um, tried um, the caricante juice and uh, he um, um, said this uh, exact word she said uh, what we making lemonade because because uh, um, the caricante the juice of caricante is very very uh, a very high acidity uh, so uh, when uh, you taste during the fermentation um, it's very strong it's very not um, is um, uh, very high acidity and you don't understand what um, you can do in the, in the future uh, but uh, the this acidity is uh, the, um, the most part of this acidity is uh, uh, malic acid so uh, after the malolactic fermentation, the wine uh, became very, very complex and very uh, round. Uh, when I taste this wine, and I feel the, the smell of white flower, um, like uh, Sambuco or uh, the flower, um, I said always that I, I I feel the, the, the smell of uh, uh, Nespolo flower, but I don't know in English uh, how you say Nespolo. <laughs> Antonio, can you help me? It probably doesn't exist in English. Nespolo. You know? No, uh, I think it's just Nespolo. Yeah, we just have to let it exist in, in Sicily. Let me look it up online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I always get, uh, I find often there's a, like an almond blossom, kind of like an almond, uh, there can be kind of an almond quality. Uh, to these wines as well the almond the almond yeah, yeah. you you feel the almond uh, yeah, yeah. taste oh. no the the nespolo is uh, because uh, nespolo is a plant is a plant that make flower in november so when uh, all the plants are without any leaves nespolo and the flower so is um, um, the nespolo have not uh, any 
um, um, mix with other uh, flower. You feel only this in November. So, uh, guys, apparently it's called medlar. M E D. Medlar, yes, medlar. A R. I like it. I like it better in Italian. I think it sounds better in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Alice, what do you what do you like to eat? What kind of things do you like to eat with uh, the Enna Bianco? Um, I like um, um, eat um, uh, a lot of things because um, because um, uh, the good acidity is uh, is good for uh, um, for cheese, uh, but you can uh, eat also uh, some kind of pasta. Um, Veg with vegetables uh, or uh, some um, different kind of um, of um, meat, but not very fat meat. Uh, but if you hit some um, some uh, kind of meat, uh, um, no, no, not pork, but uh, some um, like a, um, chicken or something okay. uh, kind of meat. Is this is this the flower or is this a different flower? Wow! <laughs> no, this is this is a wild flower. Wild uh, flower. But that's not the yeah. nespola. It's different. No, 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 no. No, no. Nespola. Nespola is a a, a, a orange fruit. Okay. Yeah, is uh, is orange fruit very very juicy, um, and I I will show you next time. Next time. Okay, I understood. <laughs> well, that was a beautiful picture of one of your vineyards. So, at any rate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alicia. So I'm going to move on to the uh, Etna Rosado now, and uh, we don't have. Um, this is a uh, wine from uh, Massimiliano Calabretta, um, and I will uh, show off Massimiliano. He is um, uh, a total character. But um, before we do that, um, I think. You know, I want to introduce uh, the red grapes of, of Etna, the noble red grapes. So we talked about Caracante. Um, Cacerato is, is the most widely grown grape um, in Sicily. Um, and Cacerato goes into uh, Marsala historically. Um, uh, and it, it can make, you know, kind of fun wines. But, um, you know, Caracante has much more ageability, uh, certainly. Um, on the red side, uh, the most important red grape is uh, Norella Mascalesi. Um, and Norella refers to the color. Um, Mascalesi comes from uh, Mascala, which is a, a corner of, of Sicily. Um, they have discovered uh, that uh, Norello Mascalesi is actually the uh, offspring of, of two grapes, one of which most of you will know, uh, Sangiovese, uh, is one of the parents of Norello Mascalesi. The other parent is uh, Mantonica Bianco. Mantonica Bianco is, is from um, Calabria, um, across uh, the, the Strait of Messina. Um, uh, so. It's actually thought that the grape might have originated in Calabria and then come over uh, to Mount Etna, but it is indisputably the Etna um, uh, red grape. Um, I think it is significant though to understand that it hasn't been made in the style that most of us are familiar with um, until relatively re recently. So, um, you know, you look at the facility um, that uh, is lurking uh, behind uh, Mario there, and they would not have been making, you know, typically a, a red wine like this. They would have been making a wine that looked more like this. Uh, this is a traditional um, a peasant wine on Etna, and the style is called Pisto y Muta, um, and that means press and separate, and that's because, um, you know, you're living in a world without refrigeration. Fermentation happens in a place like Sicily very fast, um, and if you leave a wine on the skins for the two weeks required to make something you know, as red as either of these wines, you are inviting vinegar. Um, so um, in this case, um, they would have given the wine 24 to 48 hours on the skins and then run it off and made something with this color. And uh, they would also call it on Etna, or I'm, 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 I understand in, in Sicily, they would say like wine, red wine to go with fish. Um, and it's this beautiful chameleon kind of wine. And I, I really adore that um, about it. Um, so uh, Massimiliano, uh, Calabretta comes from um, a, a winemaking family. Um, he made wine with his father Massimo. Um, this is Massimiliano. Um, he is a professor of engineering in addition to a winemaker. So he spends part of his year in the north um, wearing a suit and tie. And then he spends part of his year on Etna um, making very soulful wines. And um, he and his father started uh, bottling their wines in 1997. Prior to that, they did what most of the same producers did, which is just invite people out to the winery, you know, fill your jug and, you know, go on. People drive out from Catania, you know, they want wine, they get wine and they go home. 
uh, but they wanted to do something, you know, more noble, more sophisticated. And, uh, and they have been making wine largely from old vines and consolidating their holdings um, ever since. Um, uh, I visited Massimiliano, his winery is insane. Um, it is outside of Rendasso in two adjoining um, uh, kind of garages, and it's a bit of a labyrinth. And uh, I can remember visiting him that, you know, he has all of these rickety ladders climbing from one tank to the next. And, you know, he invited me up and my wife wanted nothing to do with it and passed me a glass. And, um, you know, he knows where everything is, you know, because that's kind of the way his mind works. No one knows, knows where, where anything is in the winery. Um, but he makes these really beautiful, soulful uh, kinds of wines. And it was the first time that I have had a wine like this. And, and what I love about this style is that it's impossible to pigeonhole. It's impossible to easily typify. You know, it's not what we most, what most of us think of as, as rosé or risotto. It, it's not rosso either, you know, it, it's something else entirely. And it has this real historical, um, you know, kind of imprint in Etna and this historical importance in, in Etna. It's not the only, you know, kind of rosé that people are making on Etna. You have people like Alberto Gracci that are now making rosés that are more in the Provençal kind of style. But, you know, I think this is, this is one of the most special wines that Etna has. Um, because it is based in history, um, and it is, you know, so wonderful. And it's wine that ages um, really beautifully um, as well and, and can go with anything. So I, I, you know, invite you all who've never had it before to, you know, hit us up on the, on the comments, um, you know, uh, and, you know, it, it is a chameleon, and it is an alien wine in the best possible sense. Um, and the last thing I wanted to introduce, uh, because it will figure heavily in our conversation for the sake of um, the gentleman we're about to talk to is uh, this notion of the way that vines are traditionally trained on Etna. So uh, typically, Norella Mascalesi is trained in this form called albareo, which means little tree. Um, and albarello, traditionally, there would be a chestnut pole driven into the earth, and the vines would be encouraged to train vertically. But there would be no wires, there would be no espalier. Um, you know, these are vines that are placed very close together. Um, they're not trained in rows, although very often they would plow. And they start to look like old olive trees as they grow and they're poetic and beautiful. And, you know, that's something that, um, you know, Mario celebrates on his labels. You can, you know, see um, on the label, um, these older vines that, you know, have this like beautiful, you know, kind of, you know, personality uh, one uh, to the next. And, you know, I can remember, you know, traveling vineyards with, um, you know, Mario's vineyard manager in particular. And, and, you know, in these older vineyards, he had his favorite vines. So he's very excited to show off his one, one vine in particular that he had named that was, you know, his, you know, personal favorite. And, and they, they do have, you know, this amazing personality and, and you know, kind of life uh, all, their, all their own. Um, at any rate, without further ado, um, let us move on to uh, Edna Rosso. And uh, that leaves us, of course, with the, the one, um, the only uh, Antonio Venanti. Antonio, your family um, figured hugely in the modern revival of wine on Etna. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about the estate? Bill, sorry, I missed the last word you said, because oh, I was just- Just uh, tell us about your family and, oh, and okay. their, their history on Etna, because you, you know, you are very unique in having made wine there for a long time. Your father was a seminal figure in the 1980s and 90s revival of wine on Etna. Yeah. Um, and then you and your brother now are, are pushing everything forward still. Sure, um, sure. Well, and thanks, Bill, for giving this nice stage and visibility to Etna. I uh, thank you on behalf of all of us. It's always we're always proud to see our wines um, being appreciated uh, so far away from home. So uh, thank you for that. You, I think you're right. Uh, thank you for crediting my father Giuseppe for what he has done um, when. We started to make wine professionally, it was 1988, which is 32 years ago. Um, like, like Massimiliano Calabretta's family, my family was also growing vines like, like many others, even in the 1800s. But I don't want to claim that we are a 200-year-old winery. We are a 32-year-old winery, which on Etna is quite, quite an age. Uh, there were maybe uh, three or four uh, proper wineries at that time, uh, and now it's about 150. Wow. So Etna has really moved forward in the meantime. So, um, what? 
Antonio, how many of those 150, how many are owned by Sicilians versus, you know, people from other part of Italy or, you know, people from other part of the world? I would say that about two thirds or even uh, more than that, maybe 75% are actually owned by locals. Yeah. Um, Mario, for example, is a local by now. He's <laughs> <laughs> originally from Rome. <laughs> it's funny, when I when I moved back to Italy uh, after 15 years abroad in the uh, early 2000, I made, became friends with Mario, and um, so he's been he's been on the island now for 20 years. <laughs> he's a local, so we are all friends. Alice, Mario, I'm very happy to be you know in the same Zoom conference as friends. Uh, going back to uh, what my father did, yes, my father is actually a um, pharmacist, but he has always collected wine and has, he has traveled for wine um, to taste wines and to wine regions. And when he was 43, um, because his father had basically stopped uh, really look, looking after vineyards because he had started another business, my father decided to uh, basically uh, take it a step forward and his idea was to uh, really set a very high standard on Etna at a time when these varieties were not so well known. Um, and Etna itself, even the locals did not know Nerello Mascalese or Carricante that well. So it was really greenfield activity and uh, my father decided to aim very high. One of the things we um, focused on since the very beginning was to um, have a presence on more than one site of the volcano. <clears throat> um, I, can, uh, uh, I can pull up a map again if you want to, uh, you know, talk over some of the individual sites. Yeah, I, I have another map behind. <laughs> 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 so uh, we believe, we believe, yeah, so uh, we started in the north of Etna in an area called Rovitello, and then immediately, this was 1988, and then uh, our first wine is called Rovitello. It comes from Castiglione di Sicilia on the northern slope. But in the very same year, uh, we also released a wine from Milo, which is on the eastern slope facing the sea. And in the uh, early in the mid 1990s, uh, we started to release wines from the southwest of Etna in an area called Santa Maria di Licodia. And then 20 years ago, 1998. Uh, we were able to reunite uh, the actual family site in Via Grande on the southeast. So um, we actually started uh, with two wines, an Etna Bianco Superiore and an Etna Rosso. Um, now we make uh, 15 wines, one five, um, a few Bianco, uh, then one Rosato or Rosé. Um, some Contrada specific reds and some vineyard specific reds as well. Robert Kennedy carries basically all of them. Um, and so in 2012, my twin brother Salvino and myself, we took over uh, the total management of the winery and we have basically leveraged what my father had done for many years, yes, now, the photographer wanted us to look like Nerello Mascalese. That's my father. My father, obviously, the guy with the gray or white hair. I'm in the middle, and my brother is next to me. Uh, this is Rovitello on the northern slope. So, um, that's, uh, not a bad, that's not a bad office. Uh, no, it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, so, 2012, the second generation took over. My father is obviously still there, uh, providing inspiration. And we have, we have kept uh, a number of the wines he started to make, like Rovitello, Pietra Marina, Serra della Contessa, Nerello Cappuccio, and so forth. And then we have added a few ones, which are not here today. What we are tasting today is our Etna Rosso. 2016, which is actually um, a blend of vineyards. So um, this is a wine that is meant to represent the winery as a whole because the vineyards for this wine are located on three different slopes. 
So there are some of the grapes from Santa Maria di Licodia in the southwest at about 3,000 feet. And then <clears throat> Monte Serra, southeast, at about 1,500 feet. And Rovitello in the north of Etna, about, at about 2,400 feet. So we needed one wine that would represent the whole winery. And it's this Etna Rosso. That's why it does not bear the name of a specific place, like other wines do. It's just Etna Rosso. And will you speak to, um, you know, I think it's, it's such a, you know, kind of, I mean, Etna is a, a huge volcano, but, you know, it's a relatively small corner of the world. How yes. do the red wines from the north side of the volcano differ from the east, differ from the south? Okay, well, um, first, uh, Bill, one thing about how Etna, the Etna DOC production is broken down. Um, like Alice was saying, uh, not that long ago, most of the wines from the volcano were red wines. I remember when I was discussing Etna, even, even just seven or eight years ago, um, we were always talking about 80%, 85% of the wines from Etna being Etna Rosso and the vineyard surface being Nerello Mascalese. A very interesting trend that we have been experiencing in the last five or six years, is the growth of <clears throat> all the other sub-appellations. So today, Etna Rosso accounts for about 60% of the Etna production. These are official data from the 2019 Consorzio Etna Doc. And Bianco, Etna Bianco now accounts for 28, 29%. Wow. And uh, the balance uh, is actually growing shares of uh, rosato and spumante and then you have tiny tiny percentages below one percent of bianco superiore and rosso riserva so etna is becoming a region where that will of course be driven by red wines but where the other the other sub appellation bianco rosato spumante have become very important and it's, I think, one of the things that makes Etna different if compared to other wine regions where clearly they have one specific inclination. Regions known for being outstanding for whites, others known for being outstanding for reds, others that specialize in rosé or sparkling wine. Well, Etna is very versatile. Not only the wine from Etna, but the region of Etna itself can really give rise to amazing wines in all these different categories. And Nerello Mascalese, going back to your question, Nerello Mascalese is the most widely planted grape. So assuming that the vinification is the same, so assuming it's the same, the same uh, people making wine on north and southern slope, normally on the northern slope, you find a lot of elegance and finesse and floral notes and high acidity, very precise wines. On the southern slope, again, assuming we are vinifying them in the same way and, and so forth, you will find wines that are uh, maybe redier, slightly higher in alcohol, and a little bit fuller, reflecting a slightly warmer climate, but always within a frame of very elegant wines. Yeah. So I think you were right uh, mentioning uh, Nebbiolo and so forth. You know, Nerello Mascalese, in my very humble opinion, is one of the greatest, greatest red grapes in the whole world. Um, and Carricante <laughs> is one of the greatest white grapes. Um, this wine, Etna Rosso, you, before we uh, went online, uh, we were discussing it informally. You're right, this is one of the wines that we have changed a bit since we took over. When my father started in 1988, this was fully oaked. There was never a taste of oak. There was never any trace of oak on the palate. But this was a wine that was going through a, um, several months in oak. Whereas now it's mostly a stainless steel wine with some oak for the Nerello Mascalese. Whereas the Nerello Cappuccio component is fully stainless steel. 
What might be interesting, Bill, um, is to maybe explain what Nerello Mascalese brings and what Nerello Capuccio brings. If you think that is interesting, I can, I can discuss that. Yeah, go for it. Okay, because you mentioned Capuccio. Um, uh, Etna Rosso can either be 100% Nerello Mascalese or it can be a blend. When it's a blend, it must be a blend of Etna, uh, sorry, Nerello Mascalese, at least 80%. The balance, you know, the remainder being Nerello Cappuccio. Now, Cappuccio is much, much less frequent. There is maybe 1% of the Etna vineyards. It's, it's less pale. It's still pale, but it's less pale with some violet nuances. The nose is much more herbaceous and spicy and smoky. And the palate is much less tannic. Nerello Mascalese, very pale, more driven by red fruit, highly acidic, more tannic. So when they are together, in our opinion, uh, they really help one another, especially in young Etna Rosso. For wines that are meant to age much longer, we either go for the full 100% Nerello Mascalese or from the co-planted vineyards like Rovitello, Serra della Contessa, there are tiny, tiny fractions of um, that That is a, that's an amazing segue because it brings us to um, uh, Mario's wine here. So, um, uh, Mario, you um, patiently waited uh, uh, in your uh, underground palmetto lair uh, while we have been uh, uh, discussing these other wines. And I want you to speak to the Etnis because this is a 2011, it's a, a very special wine. Um, uh, what is the, you know, so I know it's, it's a broad range of ages uh, for the sake of these individual vines, but some of these vines are, what, 100? 100 years old almost? Yes, yes. Some of the wines uh, here, I am now in the vineyard uh, of the of the Etneus because I am here in uh, in Morganazzi where there is, uh, mo mo most of our vineyards are here, but specifically the very first vineyard where uh, I started in 2007 uh, uh, um, in Custodi. Uh, it was specific this vineyard, which is uh, almost two hectares, uh, uh, about 100 years old. Uh, that, uh, that means um, in, the, in an Alberello vineyard that not all the wines are uh, 100 years old, but that means that uh, like the oldest ones are 100 years old, uh, and then uh, uh, an Alberello vineyard, a bash uh, bush wine vineyard, you never replace it in once. You just replace a single vine if it dies. So, so we have a lot of very old vines, uh, up to 100 years, and then we have like uh, a little bit younger and younger and younger, and then and then we have like uh, the, the wines we, we replaced it in the last uh, in the last 10 years. So it, each vineyard is a kind of uh, is a kind of village. It's a village of, of people, of, uh, in this case, in this specific, the Etneus, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's specific uh, only Nerello Mascalese and Nerello Cappuccio. So it's, it's only two families, not more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but sometimes in the very, very old, in the very, very old vineyards, you have also uh, some very few wines of uh, uh, other varieties that were planted in the uh, in the 19th century so over 150 to 100 years old year, years ago and um are these uh vines grafted are they ungrafted what's the percentage the oldest one uh, the oldest one uh, are, are ungrafted yeah. uh the newest one uh, we replace it uh, we replace uh, grafted uh, because um, uh, because when when the when, when the soil uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's strict uh, so when you replace a vineyard uh, you need to be you, a certain percentage of uh... yeah because because the soil is too is too tight uh, to to plant and craft it but uh, but some of our vineyards uh, we planted. Uh, um, from from scrap, so so we planted new. Uh, some of these vineyards uh, we planted partly uncrafted because uh, because in this case uh, when we have the chance to to move around uh, all the um, uh, all, uh, all all the all the vineyards uh, all the land uh, so so 
and, and make it very, very soft. In this case, we can plant uh, as well ungrafted. Now, now, you and Antonio, you know, in addition to being on the same mountain, you share, you know, some common influences for the sake of, you know, having worked, both worked with Savo Foti, um, yeah. who is a, a pioneering um, Sicilian viticulturalist. This is, this is Salvo, um, who is, you know, one of, you know, the amazing, um, you know, kind of uh, real champions of native grapes um, in, in Sicily. Um, and, uh, you know, is, is, you know, worked throughout Etna to, to promote, um, you know, the uh, native grapes and the older vineyards and, and plots and stuff. But um, you also share that, so you make a wine called Pistus that's made largely in stainless and really pre like pure. Whereas, um, you know, uh, this is from older vines. How do you make this kind of differently than, you know, um, a wine that would be more analogous to, um, you know, Antonio's Etna Rosso? Yeah, the differences. Uh, yeah, the the differences. The main differences between the, the Pisus and the Etneus is that uh, Pisus is coming mostly from uh, younger vineyards, and Pisus uh, is only uh, stainless steel. Uh, for the Etneus, uh, actually, Etneus is these specific vineyards. All our wines, uh, uh, they are coming uh, from, uh, from from a single vineyards. They don't have. Uh, the denomination of the Contrada, but they will have it very soon. So like uh, uh, the Pistus and the Rosato uh, 19, uh, they already have uh, the Contrada oh, so under. Cool. Yeah, they, all the, our wines from uh, some of them from 18 vintage and all, but all, all the other wines from 19 vintage, they will all have uh, uh, the Contrada. The because, single Contrada, uh, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like the, the Pistus, uh, what you have on the label of the Pistus actually is uh, this house uh, where uh, where where I am now. Uh, oh, lovely! To you. That's and, um, and so so the difference is the main difference is uh, is of course uh, the, the the age of the vineyard because Pisus is young vines uh, and Etneus uh, is up to one hundred years old wine, and um, and also also the vinification because uh, Pisus is only stainless steel. In Etneus, uh, we do. Um, uh, longer, slower uh, vinification uh, in steel, uh, and then uh, uh, we do a little bit stronger extraction, and uh, and so we do uh, we do at least a couple of years, uh, sometimes three years uh, of aging uh, in the wood because uh, Nerello Mascalese is uh, is very rich of tannins, uh, is 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 very elegant, but but in the same time is uh, is, is is a pretty tannic variety, so. Uh, when 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 you extract uh, um, properly, uh, you might have uh, uh, the, the the need uh, of some wood uh, to 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 make it brief and to make it softer. So the the wood, I believe, uh, for some wines, for uh, long aging wines especially, it's very important uh, not really to give, uh, but more to take out. So to make it uh, to, 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 to make the wine breathe uh, and get it like nicer, smoother, softer. Yeah. On, on um, so I just uh, I'm gonna set up a couple questions and then Sarah yeah. and Thomas will will give you a chance to, to weigh in. Um, but uh, so for the sake of everyone playing along here, um, uh, Mario mentioned Contrade. Contrade are the they're kind of like smaller village and neighborhoods uh, yeah. on the on and they they are um, they don't necessarily, in, in French, they would say like Ludi, but Ludi is almost like a vineyard, individual vineyard. Contrade is a little bigger than that. Um, it's a little you know, bigger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a little it's bigger a, than that. <laughs> it's, it's a dominazione. It's yeah, a, yeah, uh, yeah. And what's, what's really fun about Etna, as you can imagine, so now Etna is a very ancient, in, in human terms, ancient winemaking yeah. culture. In geologic terms, it's a baby. You know, it's, it's a few hundred thousand yeah. years old. And you can imagine with all of these lava flows, and the, given the different rates of cooling on the lava and different component parts and all, you have a lot of diversity of soil types in you know a, a small area, and and that's what the Contrada is all about, and and that really is the next kind of you know evolution in Etna wine is exploring you know those different sites and what makes them expressive and, and special from from what yes. the next and then yeah, as as Antonio said. Uh... As Antonio said, uh, Etna is, uh, is, is really a very, very great terroir because it's one of the very few places in the world when you can have, where you can have uh, what, what 
wines, what great wines uh, and uh, red great wines. Uh, because uh, you can play with a lot of uh, uh, variables. Uh, you can play with, um, uh, with the soil, of course, uh, with all uh, the different lava, but especially I think that the most important uh, are uh, two other different things. The first one is uh, uh, the positioning. So Antonio talked about, uh, um, uh, and, and also Alicia about uh, uh, south, south, uh, south, uh, west, uh, east, uh, and north. These are the three main uh, uh, important slopes of the Etna. And uh, uh, east uh, has, has a very, very different weather. It's mostly uh, it's, it's it's mostly a zone, so it's much wetter there. So so yeah. For this, yeah, so just to give you all a, a sense and, and see the map one more time here, um, uh, on the east side of Etna, it gets much more rain uh, than exactly. it does. Because it does yes, if you see the map, if you see the map, you see east is where Etna is touched by the sea. Yeah. So imagine, yeah. imagine like uh, uh, yeah, ten thousand feet mountain uh, right on the sea, and uh, with with most of the winds uh, blowing uh, from southeast. So you, you just have like this humid air coming from, uh, from southeast here, where, where you see from your right, and, and, and getting like uh, uh, 10,000 feet mountain. So yeah, and, and so that is typically, so uh, typically it's more of a zone for uh, white grapes in Caracante. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, in, in and around this particular village, Milo, is a very yeah. famous uh, set of vineyards for Caracante in particular, and that's where the Etna Bianca Superiore uh, DOCG has been has been established. Um, yes, and then there are other other elements too because a lot of times when uh, the mountain um, uh, erupts and starts to spew ash, a lot of it moves south and uh, east. So this zone south and east of the mountain is also can be very fertile um, and and much more fertile than other parts of the mountain. In addition to the the, the southern exposition, so you know there are all these subtle variables affecting you know the yeah also another with. another very important point, uh, very another very important variable is uh, is the altitude because you have different weather so you have the east if you think of sicily you think about like uh, dry i mean sicily is the is the warmest and the driest region in sicily but the village of milo the specific village of milo is one of the rainiest villages in italy so you have in the, in the driest region you have a very small village you have a rainforest in a desert yeah exactly so yeah. It's, it's, yeah. A, it's a very very particular and very specific and then you have the altitude altitude is also is very important because uh, making the wine at uh, uh, three thousand feet it's not the same of making it uh, at um, uh, two thousand feet so yeah. it's not it's it, it it changes so so this is also it's very important so like there are like in the north uh, in the north side which is the best place probably for uh, the Nerello Mascalese and the Nerello Cappuccio but making it uh, very very sometimes very very easy very very comfort at 2000 feet is not the same that making it at 9000 feet so you have differences in uh, concentration uh, in elegance uh, and also uh, in, in, the, in the vintages, because there are very, very dry vintages where uh, if you are the highest you are, the best you are. But also at the same time, there are sometimes uh, some very, very difficult vintages, cold and rainy, where it's very tough to make it, to, to, to make like, uh, uh, to, get to, to, to get grapes uh, uh, at, at oh, yeah. a nice level of maturation yeah. or the, with, with, with a very good uh, healthiness uh, at uh, 3,000 feet. Um, so this is also it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think too. You know, it just I think for the people that you know love Etna and get excited about it, and I'm sure for for you that live there, it it doesn't feel like you know it's you know something that's ending or something that is tired and old. It feels like something that we're just beginning to start to appreciate. Just beginning. Yeah, yeah. 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 This, uh, is, there, this is this is this is something that uh, also thanks to to, to Alicia or or to, to people, to, 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 to Giuseppe Benanti, the, the, the father of Antonio and Salvino, yeah. and, and Salvo also. It's, it's something that, that, that was started and that now are uh, 
uh, are known worldwide. But this is the, this is really there is a, an energy, uh, yeah. and this is also the reason why in in the very very few years uh, we passed from uh, less than twenty to more than one hundred fifty producers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sarah, we've been neglecting you. Uh, what do the people want to know? Tell us, please. Um, several things, but if we could start with, um, you know, I know you touched lightly on it, but Maureen had a really good question about the Contrada versus vineyard sites. Can they, I know that the Contradas are a bit bigger, but can they intersect? And can you have like Contradas? No, no. No, Contrada, Contrada, each, uh, no, they, they cannot intersect. Okay. Each Contrada is uh, the, 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 there is a kind of limit there is a, and uh, each contrada is a, is a place and then next there is another name so they, contrada is just the name of uh, of, a spe, of of a specific area yeah so this is this is a map of the contrada between randasso and lingualusa it's not a very good map the the Italian, i don't i haven't it's it's a need we need a better map of etna contrada it needs to happen i, I don't know where it is but it needs to exist, but um, and and there's some individual producers that have started to do it, but um, no, no, no. It was made. It was made a very good job uh, uh, from um, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from from need. a guide. Uh, that, yeah. No, Mario from the Taiwanese. The Taiwanese, oh, really? exactly. <laughs> she made a very good, uh, very incredible <laughs> job from the Taiwanese. From the Taiwanese, we have. We we have a made in China Etna map. Oh, really? It's better. Made in China. I know, I know. But <laughs> made in uh, Taiwan. <laughs> so that was, that was the Italian Contrade map. Those. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Bill, may I add one thing on the Contrade thing? Yeah. Um, um, the uh, Contrade is a terminology that already existed. Uh, before the Etna wine uh, boomed and became known. So basically we, have, we are using a pre-existing grid or like a way of segmenting regions. And like you said, our job now is to really be able to go much more in depth and define every single contrada. There are 133 contrade but we are adding more because some of them are already within the Etna DOC area but are not listed. And then the next step is to, ideally, we, we all want to get to a stage where wines from a specific contrada will reflect exactly that, that, those, that unique mix of elevation, soil type, ventilation, light intensity, and so forth. So we are... We are working on mapping Etna better, and we are working on defining every Contrada better. But like Mario said, they will never overlap. They, they are adjacent to one another, but they don't overlap. I think, I think it is important for consumers to understand that it's, it's you know, the Contrada, they're bigger than individual vineyard sites. So that you could yeah. have, it's like nesting dolls. You could have an individual, so like Pilo di Mezzo has Pilo di Mezzo, like Procario. It's like an individual vineyard site within Tiro di Mezzo. Yes. So, you know, it, 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 I think it's important to under, understand, you know, how they are kind of like gradually building. And it, it's hard for consumers too, because, you know, they're not, you know, making wine in Etna, they're not on the ground and, and it, 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 it starts to get confusing. But, you know, I think for the people that, you know, truly love it, you know, you start to understand and live with, you know, the ways in which the wines are profoundly different. And you want other people to be able to understand that as well. I think, Bill, just think in terms of uh, like um, villages like Castiglione, Randazzo, Milo. They are broken down into uh, frazioni or fractions like Passo Pisciaro, Rovitello, Monte La Guardia. Monte La Guardia uh, is part of Randazzo, Passo Pisciaro and Rovitello are part of Castiglione, for example. And then each of these are, have their contrade. Yeah. And then you can single out, but you cannot officially write it on a bottle of Etna DOC, a vineyard name. We are actually getting, um, because I'm currently the president of the Etna DOC consortium, uh, we are also working on being able to identify and register old vineyards on Etna so that one day we can claim those on the bottle 
And then you will have the vineyard, the contrada, the frazione, and the comune. Oh. And it's mm. all within the province of Catania, which is, the whole of Etna is within the province of Catania, but then you have all these different comuni, and there are 20 comuni or villages within Etna, and 133 contrade. And it's getting more and more elaborate, and like Mario said, it's so complex, I cannot think of another region with so many variables. I don't, I don't envy your job as president. <laughs> I only have one more year left. So <laughs> I'm, I'm no, we don't know, we don't know. Maybe more, maybe more. I don't, I don't have any more gray hairs on your head. Uh, so uh, for, the, for example, in uh, Cruci Monaci, there is uh, only my vineyard. This is a single vineyard and the, the single contrada. In, um, I have a, a contrada only for me. It's like a monopole. In Pedro di Mezzo, the old name was Porcaria, but now Pedro di Mezzo, Pedro di Mezzo, there are a lot of producers that are making their wine in, uh, in, in Pedro di Mezzo as well. We have our own uh, vineyard, uh, a very old one uh, in Pedro di Mezzo. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very different. Uh, this is, uh, and, and I think that it's, 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 a very, it's a big work that the consortium has to do, but I'm sure that it, I think that it is very important that they will do it because uh, it's important they have, I mean, it's something that must, must be done. I think it's, it's amazing too, you know, for me, I, I, so I think being from, so I am from, you know, kind of the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and kind of like being from, you know, somewhere, but it's also, it's also like being from everywhere. There's not a, you know, strong local tradition. And in Sicily, there's this hyper locality. So on Etna, you have individual styles of wine, but throughout the island, you have a village that's famous for its lentils. There's a DOC for carrots. You know, you have yeah. cherry tomatoes and, you know, you know that, are, that are like the most famous cherry tomatoes. And so it's just like that hyper locality is really magical. And I think, you know, um, for people that aren't used to it, it's really special and, and worth, worth celebrating. Uh, Sarah, what else do you have for us? Well, that kind of brings me into another question that people have, which is the comparison of the, the grape varietals that are kind of more prominent on Mount Etna um, to varietals on other parts of Sicily, like near Davila, and just talking about the differences of those varietals. Presidente. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I think what um, I would like to say on behalf also of Alice and Mario, ne let's never forget that Etna, Etna only accounts for 2,500 acres. So it's 1,000 hectares, which is less than, it's about 1.5% of the entire Sicilian vineyard surface. So what is, um, you know, the mainstream or the main Sicilian varieties are not common and are har they hardly exist on Etna. I think maybe in terms of say Nero Davola, for example, is the most important Sicilian variety. So we could, we could think of Nero Davola as a more, uh, like fuller bodied and more alcoholic and more structured type of wine. But again, you can grow Nero Davola in Feudo Montoni, close to Agrigento in Palermo, at a very high elevation of 2,000 feet, and it will be very different from a Nero Davola grown in Noto. So, but anyway, uh, disregarding where it could be planted, I would say that Nerello Mascalese is always the elegant and the highly acidic and crisp, age-worthy, age. uh, red fruit driven, smoky and earthy variety. And then Frappato might have some similarities in terms of taste with Nerello Cappuccio, darker in color, very juicy, less tannic, maybe better drunk young. Nero Davola, fuller bodied, um, very often higher in alcohol and very age-worthy. Uh, very often with those tertiary notes that come out quite early. So in a nutshell, Etna is really the elegant side of Sicily because of the higher elevation, the volcanic soil, and the indigenous varieties. I, I think also something that people don't totally understand is, 
Um, so, you know, we're talking about one great varietal, but in a American context, you know, you talk about one great varietal, you're talking about genetically identical grapes. You're talking about people propagating grapes that are bought from a nursery and genetically identical. That is not the case on Etna. On no. Etna, you know, the Norella Moscalesi from one vineyard to the next is genetically distinct because these are older traditions. And, you know, so people are, are, are growing, you know, very, you know, they're, they're, they're siblings, you know, or, you know, they're very closely related, but they're not genetically identical. It is an older way of working. And there, there is much more heterogeneity within that vineyard than is common in most new world industrial uh, uh, vineyards. And, and that gives the wines a bit of a life of their own uh, as well. For no, but, uh, Sorry, you might go ahead. No, uh, this, this, this is really very, very, very right, Bill. Um, in, in the vineyard, in the very old vineyard, uh, I, I was talking before in Ferdo di Mezzo, uh, this is 250 years old vineyard with the 200 years old uh, uh, wines growing up to 250 years old wines growing, growing there. And uh, part of this wine, when they were planted, they, they used to plant and they, they, uh, also white grapes in the middle because they wanted to do the red wine and the white wine. So we have, uh, we have like a very, a very little quantity of white grapes, less, less than 10%, I can say. And uh, so one year uh, we collected, all, always we collect the white grapes before uh, because we harvested the whites a couple of weeks before and then the red. So we harvested the, the white before. And since there were uh, not very much, about like 20 boxes, um, I said, okay, 20 boxes, uh, we, can, we can see, we can see what, what, what we have here. And uh, so we separated uh, for varieties. And uh, in just 20 boxes, in about uh, one hectare vineyard, uh, we, we separated uh, nine different uh, varieties wow. of white grapes. And actually, we really recognized uh, very, very easily uh, five. The other four, I don't know, <laughs> I mean, I mean but, but what, what that, that does it really matter when you have like one box of something uh, some something you don't know of. and uh, so and but and, and these uh, these really um, genetical varieties uh, you you can have you can have a lot especially in the very old vineyards because uh, if now uh, we plant uh, we we try specifically like the genetic uh, to get the best uh, uh, the best grapes uh, that, that will give the best result for this region. This is exactly the opposite thought that uh, they were doing in the past because 200 years ago, they just, they just wanted to plant it as much different they have available because uh, their target was to collect something. And uh, since there are some varieties uh, more uh, sensible to disease uh, than other, so they, the, more, the, 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 the most different they planted in the past, uh, the, 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 the more they were like sure to, to collect something because there was less the risk that a single disease would affect all the vineyard. So maybe like a disease would arrive that year and it affect some part of the vineyard, but well, some well, other right, varieties yes. that will be more resistant. It's like to have like uh, um, a financial uh, portfolio, the most, uh, the, 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 the most different, uh, and, and then you, you, you like, you uh, arise the risk of, uh, of, of problems. It's like you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket would be the... Uh, exactly, uh, exactly. Um, so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to just, uh, we, I'm sure we have some more questions. I, I, I want to thank, um, if you're, if you're willing to hang on, uh, we would love to have you. Antonio, I know you have. Um, Jack Ryan to get to at some point, <laughs> but, but uh, I'm sure we have more questions. I just want to thank everyone for, for joining us. And we, so for, for all of you participating from Aetna, we, we typically give a toast um, uh, alone together, but also, you know, in, in Sicilian fashion, Cendani as well. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Eh? Thank you. Thank you. Ho finito io il vino. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no,
Yo ya no tuve, yo ya no tuve rosado. Si no es mío. Sarah, what else do you have for us? Um, well, as always, um, people want to know how climate change has affected all of the vineyards. Right? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> allora, I can, allora, I, I, can, I, can say, I can say my, from, from my side, climate change is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's effect, uh, especially what I see. I, can, I cannot talk about, uh, I don't want to talk about uh, uh, warning on because we have we have some warning but this is not significant what I see really as a, as a very dangerous uh, thing and this is uh, it's not like something that you can uh, um, evaluate but this is something objective I mean it's not something sub subjective like uh, it's warmer it's or uh, it's not warmer but something objective absolutely is that you have uh, uh, a lot more uh, within the last few years, uh, um, very dramatic, uh, like uh, um, more uh, storms. Uh, yeah. Hey, exato. Hey, yeah. hail. This is. How do you, uh, how do you, say, how do you really... say that? What do you, what do you say in Italian for hail? Grandine, grandine. Grandine. Bravo, grandine. Nice, 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 nice. And and you see like the, these very very <laughs> strong uh, happenings, uh, such as like some uh, very very strong wind. Uh, very strong wind uh, or uh, hail, uh, hail storm uh, or uh, like uh, heavy rains uh, or like very, very uh, long uh, dry mounds. I mean, uh, and this is, this is the worst because it's not like uh, an average temperature which is like uh, 0 0.05 uh, higher yeah. in, than, 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 than a year before. They, they, they really, I mean, the, it's, uh, the, the great problem uh, and uh, and what what is really danger for uh, is is this um, uncontrollable uh, nature happenings. It's, it's interesting, Mario. So you know, uh, we actually make wine in the East Coast and in in Virginia and DC and environs. And yeah. the the thing that they have the wine growers have noticed is you know more than you know extremes of temperature is. Uh, wet weather. So the local climate is getting a lot wetter and the uh, uh, individual events, you know, the individual rain events are more dramatic, um, you know, from, from vintage to vintage. And, and I think, I think on Aetna, you do have the advantage of being able to go higher, you know, so, you know, yeah. two, three, you know, four degrees Celsius, you know, at the very least, you can work your way slowly, you know, up the mountain for the second. Yeah, but 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 Bill, this works for the temperature, but doesn't work for the hail. Eh? <laughs> the more you go higher, the more it's dangerous than for. Uh... Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, Bill, just one one data on. Uh, we recorded the harvest date in Milo, uh, for our white wines over the last twenty years, and on average we now harvest about six days earlier than uh, twenty years ago. Wow. But again, exactly. like Mario said, the main thing is the erratic, uh, like the huge variation you can experience from one year to the other. But like you said, Etna can really, can really weather any kind of storm unless you really get hail. You know, we tend to release wines every year because Etna, you know, with the elevation, the nice wind, the drainage in the soil, uh, it's, it's very hard to then get a vintage that you're not confident to uh yeah you, you can skip some but again it's a it's quite a it's a special place consistent yeah consistent very place. special yes yeah. <laughs> but sometime yeah. also the hail uh, can be can be good because uh, um if the hail came uh, when um uh, the grape uh, is um, uh, the bunch is uh, um, not not uh, ripe. Um, it's like um, um, an operation that uh, put off some some grape. And, like green, green uh, so harvester. Uh, yes. So the, the um, sometimes can uh, uh, can do very interesting wine because it, the wine can the, was uh, more concentrated 
um, from um, from the vineyard. Um, but uh, mm, depends on the moment. Um, always uh, is very very dangerous. But sometimes you can uh, make good wine also with hail. Okay. Sarah, what else you got for us? What's the dessert wine market like on Etna? Dessert that? wine, no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vino uh, dolce. Pasito. Is there pasito? Oh, the serve, the serve. There's, some, there's some people making pasito now? There are maybe... I two think, or uh, one. Uh, destro. <laughs> I know, no, I know two. No, the also, also Chilio. Also Chilio. Chilio. Yeah, Chilio. Maybe three. Chilio. Three. Uh, the, there is no such thing as an Etna DOC pasito. Or in any way, I think it's really, really uh, neglectable. Acna does not have the indigenous variety that is aromatic. I feel like Caracante could could do it. Uh, Caracante is, is is not too much on Acna to make yeah. pasito. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but also, but also, we it, it wouldn't. Don't remember, don't forget they are late uh, late ripening varieties. So by the time we harvest our caricante, yeah, it's already too late. Over, it's not warm enough to then do any right. drying. Yeah, yeah. It would have to be artificial. Uh, I personally see, as this is just me speaking, <coughs> sweet wine, like dessert wines, as not really a thing that Etna should get into. But, but I think what you can do is sparkling wine that I think people haven't fully appreciated yet. <laughs> yeah, actually the, yeah. the share of Etna Spumante is growing and growing. Yeah, and um, there are uh, today about twenty twenty five producers of sparkling wine on the volcano. Well, and, and I think I think like Norello in particular makes really interesting sparkling wine, and and it gives you and it's also I think for the growers is really good because you can you can harvest a little earlier. It gives you it gives you us you know in in bad vintages it gives you like a you can hedge your bets a little bit and do something with with the fruit that you know might not go into you know, another red wine. Like Alice said, Carricante is very precious. And so we, we use it. I mean, we do make a little bit of a sparkling wine, Benanti, but we're also releasing a Nerello Mascalese sparkling wine. Uh, the appellation does not currently allow Carricante. So a sparkling wine from Etna is an Etna Spumante, whereas a Carricante sparkling wine on Etna cannot be called Etna Spumante. Can't you change that? You can't. You can't. Uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the members of the consortium are all in favor. So I cannot change it. Uh, Sarah, what else do you have for us? Um, the, you know, the one last burning question is kind of some of the wines that you, you put on the website, which is, you know, Frank Cornelison. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we haven't, so, exactly. So um, I, I will say, I'll, I'll preface this with I think that, um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm not Sicilian, I'm not Italian. And, and uh, I think a lot of you know, credit and attention has gone to other people that look like me. You know, I mean, like so Frank is, Frank makes interesting wines, you know, um, uh, Anna Martins makes interesting wines, et cetera. Like, but, um, you know, I, I think, it is, you know, important to be giving credit to, you know, Sicilians with roots on, on the mountain. Um, by the same token, there are a lot of people making wine in a lot of different styles on, on Etna. Um, you know, how do you all feel about that? You know, do you want to drink Frank's wines? Do you want to drink, you know, Vino de Anna wines? Do you, you know, accept that they are expressive of the place that is your home? Or do they feel foreign? No, we, we drink all the wines. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there are uh, funky wines uh, made by locals and by non-locals. There are uh, cleaner wines made by locals and non-locals. Wine, I think, is a very personal thing, as long as it reflects where it's made and it's true to yeah. the place. We we would enjoy it. I maybe I, I would not go for the very extreme ones. But those that are a little bit funky, but not super extreme, I'm happy to drink them. And I think, you know, they are very real wines like ours. And uh, there is definitely room for them, even though it's still quite small on Etna, um, I, I would say. 
I think I think too that uh, Aetna is still emerging, you know, on on the global marketplace, and I think there's something really special about that. I think that you know everyone, you know, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, is still very invested in the success of the the place, and there's not quite as much tribalism as there can be in other regions that are more well established, where you know there's this you know establishment that's oppressive to you know, rebel against. I, I don't, like having been to Aetna, I didn't, I didn't feel that way. It just felt like, you know, everybody wanted to drink together and celebrate what makes Aetna such a magical place. Yeah, I, I think, I think this too, I think that uh, on Aetna there is a very, very, I, I told you before, a very good energy, a very strong energy, but also uh, I think I, I feel also a very nice mood between all the producers uh, and, uh, and like each, each of us has his own style, his own, his own vision, his own way of uh, uh, growing wines uh, or uh, making the wine in the cellar. But, uh, but by the way, the, the, the most important is that uh, everyone is, 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 uh, is doing their own best uh, in terms of quality. And, uh, and like, uh, as Antonio said, there are like more funky wines, uh, more natural wines, um, uh, more uh, um, fine wines. Uh, uh, but but the important is, is 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 more is to work at the best, and and also I think that the contribution that also these wines uh, uh, gave to Etna in in terms of uh, uh, knowledge worldwide uh, it was important. I mean, yeah. and uh, and this was uh, all the work that everyone did uh, in 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 the in the last years uh, uh, to know to to know the brand Etna, to know the name Etna. Uh, all over was uh, was was anything good, and also it's it's very nice that uh, that that even uh, if we have some different styles of the wine, uh, still uh, uh, the personal relationship are very very nice and very strong. Bill, I just wanted to I just wanted to chime in here for a second from a um, importer standpoint, just to say one thing. Um, I think you're 100 percent correct. I've noticed uh, in my dealings with uh, different winemakers on Etna, they all love everyone else's success. And you can tell that in how they self-promote themselves. Um, one example is, I mean, Antonio, as you said earlier, he's the president of the DOC, and he was he was voted 100% unanimously to become the president. I highly doubt you find that in any other wine-growing region, especially so, in Italy. It, yeah, there's definitely unity. If you look at even like um, like um, cooperatives and whatnot, usually your cooperatives in northern Italy and Alto Adige work work very well, and also in Sicily. So it's kind of odd that in between they don't, but. Yeah, That's just kind of my five cents. No. You would never see that in Tuscany. No. Uh, uh, Bill, you know what? I, I think what we might be worried about uh, maybe is the other end, the other extreme. Uh, maybe some winery is growing too much or too oh. much land, too much land being exploited where, you know, even less optimal parcels. Yeah. Currently, the largest, uh, the largest, producer of Et on Etna makes about 25,000 cases. Wow. Um, so that's, that's small. And right. so we, of course, we are much more in favor of the, um, like you said, the more extreme or funky kind of, uh, let's say, um, new trend than maybe seeing kind of industrial Etna being produced which we are definitely against uh, and uh, we don't have the volumes on Aetna for Aetna to become an industrial uh, winery mm -hmm. where it's very artisanal but we yeah. will always support like you said the locals and you know everyone that is true to the territory and I think too I, I think you know for as much as you know those you know, kind of funkier styles of wine have gained traction. A lot of that becomes about marketing as well. There's nothing unnatural about what any of you are doing. Um, you know, uh, it just, I mean, depend on, depending on how you feel about the addition of sulfur, but, you know, we're dealing with wines made with native yeast, wines made hugely sustainably, you know, in, in, the, in the vineyard using artisanal, you know, methods and that are 
incredibly expressive of uh, place. And, you know, they, they are not, you know, um, I, I, there's, there's no like uh, gloss to that. You know, there's not marketability to that. They're, they're more kind of, you know, uh, soulful, you know, stay in your lane, Absolutely. you know, kind of like true to Sicily, true to Edna kind of wines, but, you know, they're not diminished at all. And, and I, think, I think that's really important to understand as, as well for people that, you know, want to drink natural, natural wine. The only thing that, you know, someone could, you know, quibble with is, is sulfur usage. And, and that is, you know, something that is not worth talking about at the moment, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it is, is historically much lower than it ever has been to begin with. Um, and, and, you know, Etna is a very special place for growing grapes because it is so easy to grow grapes without the kind of interventions that people have to use elsewhere. And I think that's, that's equally important to understand. This is something uh, that we learned to emphasize, Bill. Um, I, and I, I think we would really want all the participants to know that Etna is a very healthy place. Because we have a lot of sunshine, ventilation and drainage in the soil, the risk of fungal diseases is really low. And we never go beyond three or four preventive treatments in a whole growing season. And that is so much lower than so many other regions. And that's without fungicides or herbicides. That's just, you know, copper sulfide Absolutely. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So it's, it's, a, it's a special place. And, you could, and what's crazy about that, too, is that you could have a producer that's biodynamic and sprays copper sulfide like, you know, two dozen times during a given growing season. And, you know, that's, that's fine and they'll get all the press in the world for being biodynamic, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's just, there, it's, it's very, it becomes very arbitrary in a way that I think is important to um, acknowledge. And, and, you know, again, having, I will say, having been to Etna, I just want people to understand that, A, you should go there when circumstances allow, because it is just, it is magical. It is magical. Like, I, I remember, so I stayed on um, uh, the agriturismo that, uh, uh, um, Alberto Gracchi's cousins on Satella, uh, uh, right outside Randasso. Uh, yeah, they have, yeah, they have lo yeah, really lovely restaurant. Uh, uh, and anyway, like, so I was outside, this is at the end of August. I was outside, I was reading, uh, the, the leopard, uh, and, um, the, I had to put, I had to go back into our hotel to put on a sweatshirt because it was cold at night. And it's just, you know, it is, it's so, and the, the quality of light is just different. Like, I don't know what you guys do. I don't know if you invited photographers to consult or but the, <laughs> the light, just the light is just like totally unlike any other place I've ever been. And there, there's magic there, you know, I mean, and, and, and my wife and I, we loved Sicily. We loved everywhere we went in Sicily. Um, and, you know, I've been other parts of Italy and, but, but Edna in particular, just, it, it has this magic. Um, yeah. So at the hand we are um, not a good producer, but we are lucky to stay on Hetna. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we should I think we should leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so thank you thank you all so much. Yeah. So yeah. So special. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao.